Good morning, church. Welcome to Grace East. If you would, stand up with us. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation revealing his majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Welcome to everyone watching online. Let's read a verse together. It's from the book of Hebrews. Let us therefore go boldly unto the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's bow our heads and let's pray this morning. God, as we just come before you, we are thankful. Um, thankful that we just can take a moment out of our week and come and honor you. Um, you are the source of life for us. So, Lord, we lift up the name of Jesus today, and we honor you in all we do. It's in Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, amen. Amen. Church, it's good to be, be here with you today. And as we continue to worship, I just want us to uh, take, take a few minutes this morning and just rest in his presence. Um, think upon his holiness, uh, because in the world that we live in, um, it's easy to get distracted from the beauty of those things and the fact that he is calling us um, to righteousness and holiness. And so part of our worship to him is responding rightly to that call. Um, and the best way for us to do that, um, first and foremost, is to think about who he is and his holiness. He is, and Father, you are our perfect example 
for life and love and holiness, Father. So as we sing this song this morning about the holiness of our Father, um, let's just rest in that together. Sound good? Take my breath away. A million angels fall face down on the floor, all to echo. Holy is the Lord. My 
my heart can't help but see with all of heaven roar forever echo holy is the lord a million angels fall face down on the floor all to echo holy is the lord my heart can't help but see with all of heaven roar forever for your holiness your example to us Lord help us to carry that example to the world the community around us today Father you can do, oh God of wonder, your power has no end, the things you've done before, in greater measure, you will do again, there's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move all things are possible come on sing it with me there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up Hope arise, death has overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival. You rose in victory, and now you're seated forever on the throne. So why should my heart feel that you defeated? I will trust in you alone. There's no bruising wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. Come on, no broken body. There's no broken body you can't raise. No so that you can save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up oh god of revival let hope arise death is overcome you've already won You've already won, oh God of revival. Break. God of revival. Come awaken your people. This is our prayer today. Awaken the city, 
Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble, the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people, come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out. Pour it out, every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. The darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up. Oh God of revival. Death is overcome. You've already won. Oh God of revival, come awake! Come awake in your people. Come awake in the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will come. Chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Oh, 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 oh God of revival. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Father, we thank you for your holiness and your goodness. Let's give him a shout of praise this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would, turn and welcome someone to church this morning, and then Ross and Ari are going to share the announcements with us. Um, we're so glad that you guys are here, if you're in person and online. Um, if this is your first time visiting with us in person, there is a card in the seat back in front of you. If you want to fill that out, you can drop it in your box, in the box in the back on your way out. And also, we don't pass an offering plate, so if you have your offerings and tithes, you can put that in the envelope and drop it in the box on your way out, too. And remember, if you're watching online, if you need prayer, just to let us know that you're here, you can text WELCOME to 618-268-3090. 
So if you have your bulletins, we don't have a ton going on, but you guys always know I'm hyping up VBS. And what we need this week, the big announcement is we're having um, a decoration pickup on Wednesday. So that is um, at 730 at Unity Church in Granite. You, uh, you can call Jen. Her number's in the bulletin. But we need people that can lift things, um, have trucks, because we split the decorations with another church. So we're going to go pick them up and bring them back here. So if you can help out with that, we would appreciate it. All right, we've got some other events coming up. We have a youth game night coming up on July 3rd. That'll be from 5 to 7 p.m. So parents, if you have kids in grades 6 through 12, they're welcome. Um, you can contact Tiffany Nimmons. Her, um, her phone number is, is in the bulletin here, so check that out. We also have a women's event coming up at the Maryland Heights campus. It's called Special Summer Conversation. Um, there's going to be fun, food, and fellowship, and that's going to be on July 9th. So check the bulletin to see how you get registered for that. And lastly, we have our Men at Grace Fellowship Breakfast coming up on Saturday, July 23rd from 8 to 9 a.m. So, men, we'd like to see you there. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, everyone. Sermon notes and pens if you need them. If you're watching online, the notes are in the feed. Once again, um, welcome to church this morning. It's always a good place to be, right? Just enjoying and hearing God's Word, and enjoying God's presence in the middle of it. So we're in part 29 of the book of Romans, and so today we're landing the plane. We started this six months ago. I remember when we started, time flies. Doesn't time just fly? Like, it's, it's really, really crazy. But what we're going to look at today, we're going to talk about um, the art of affirmation, of affirming others. And so I don't know if you guys remember this guy. You guys remember this guy? doggone it, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and people like me. So sometimes you got to affirm yourself in the middle of it. But what, here's what Paul's doing. Paul is affirming people um, and honoring people that are in ministry. And here's what I want you guys to understand. Every Christian, when you become a believer, every Christian is a minister. In one way or another, every Christian is a minister. Every Christian um, has a part. Now, that doesn't mean you're a pastor, but you're a minister. And so in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, I'm going to have you guys read this with me, all right? Let's read it together. He has made us competent as ministers. All right, hold on. Everybody with me? Give me some energy here. Let's do this. All right, let's go. He has made us, there we go, competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. What's he talking about here? He's talking about what we've been learning in the book of Romans. And what he's talking about, when he's talking about the letter, he's talking about the 613 laws of the Old Testament, the Mosaic laws. And he's saying those things they kill. They don't bring life. But he's saying that the new covenant, when you're led by God's spirit, that is what brings life to you. Um, and that's what this is talking about here. That's what I'm talking about when we have, um, um, when we're ministers in each and every way. And basically, here's what ministry is. Ministry is simply affirming the gospel um, to one another, to other people in the middle of it. One of my favorite quotes is this, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. And basically he's saying, live it out. I just had this opportunity yesterday. I was in the gym. I was closing up, mopping the mats. There's three of us there, and one guy just asked this question, and the next thing I knew, I went full gospel on him. I just started telling him about the Lord and even caught myself in the middle of him, like, oh, man, I'm preaching, you know, I'm preaching to you. And he said, uh, no, no, I'm totally engaged in this. And so it's just, I love doing that. That doesn't mean everyone does that, but if the opportunity, it's something I love to do. So if the opportunity comes, you, you're, you we're to be ready to give an answer. But I think a lot of times it's just a lifestyle that we live in, it, uh, you know, the Lord in us attracts um, people to us in the middle of that. Now, Romans 16, it's the concluding words of Paul. And so what Paul does is he's, he, like I said, he's closing this whole thing out um, and he's looking at the whole picture of the ministry. There's a guy named Coolidge. He was a great preacher. And here's what he said about this profound piece of writing um, of the book of Romans. He said, it is the greatest uh, writing in history. The reformer, a guy named Martin Luther in the 15th century, uh, called Romans the greatest book in the New Testament. And when you read Romans, and like if you've not studied this, there are 29 different parts of this, and we have them on our YouTube channel. You can watch it. There's notes with, which, with each and every one of them. But this is a life changer. You will grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. I know for me, as I study this, this is a life changer. I've seen a picture of the gospel in a totally different way. I can communicate it in a little more clear way, and I love 
doing that. And so, so basically, Paul's finished off all of his heavy-duty teaching, his heavy-duty instruction, but then he has a PS, he has a postscript. And in the postscript, he wants to thank people who are in ministry with him, and he wants to talk about these people and what they've done, and he wants to elevate those particular people. And so the beauty of the Scripture is that even with the postscript, you can get something out of it. And that's what we're going to do today because there's a story behind every story and of the people that he thinks in the middle of it. So I'm, I'm going to have you guys stand. We're going to read a few uh, verses together. There's so much in this, but we're just going to read like the first four verses. We'll read them together and then I'll, I'll expound on it as we go. So let's read this. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of Chancerea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. You guys can be seated. So let's take some notes together and let's look at this. If you're, if you're filling in the blanks, um, here's what I want you to see. To master the art of affirmation, note Paul's approval. That's the first thing I want you to see in this. And here's what he says. He says, I commend to you our sister Vivi, a servant in the church. And so here's the deal. In those days, there's no post office. Paul writes this letter. He wants to get this letter to a particular church, and he's got to get it to them some way. And so what you would do is you would hand that letter off, and they would carry that letter to the particular church that you're going to uh, write it to. And so this lady is the one who, 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 who got the letter to that group of people. And so, and I'm sure that wasn't an easy task in the middle of it. So she was instrumental in the church. And then um, a couple of things about her. Here's what it says. It says that she's obviously a woman, and it says our sister Phoebe, so she's a woman, but she was also a Gentile. So she wasn't um, a Jewish person. She was a Gentile, and they were coming together. I'll explain that as we move forward. But the name Phoebe means bright and radiant. Do you guys know anybody? Does that just ring a bell in any way? Do you know anybody who's bright and radiant? I think of Ross and Ari when they do announcements. Br just bright and radiant. Love them. They're just the great people. I had a, uh, the, the 9 o'clock service. There was somebody who did not, uh, the announcement. Uh, art and he was uh, he he you know he came in with some nice really nice clothes and I'm like oh man he's he's on it so um, and here's what it says also she's named after this Greek god so she's she's a Gentile that became a Christian and here's what it says uh, it says Phoebe a servant and you can if you're taking notes you can go back to your first part just underline a servant of the church, okay? And the word servant here is the same as deacon or deaconess, all right? So she's a leader in the church, and she's working behind the scenes. She's in a, uh, a position of leadership, and typically be, uh, deaconesses in the church, they did four things in the New Testament. I'll show you what they did. They took care of the sick and the poor. They visited the martyrs in prison, providing them with food, clothing, and correspondence. They participated in baptism because in the New Testament church, there were always large baptisms um, that went on. And then they ministered to women in general in the church. And so here's, if you think about Phoebe, you just think about this. Once upon a time, there's a lady named Phoebe, okay? And Phoebe has an assignment. And her assignment is to deliver a letter to a group of people. And this letter is, and she doesn't know it, but this letter is going to change the world. And so that's her assignment. So let me, let, me, let, me give that, let me take it down to personal. For each and every one of us, God has assigned you to something, okay? Um, and your assignment is unique because you're, in, you're unique. And it's God's plan for you, and, it, and it's to a people. And it's for a purpose. I was, uh, I was going this week to get my hair cut. I was going to my daughter-in-law. I was thinking about it on the way, and I was thinking, man, I can't wait to get my hair cut. Can you guys relate to that? When, like, when you, now, there were guys in the first service that were like, hey, no, I can't relate to that, okay? But, but I can't wait to get a haircut. So I went, and I talked to her when I went, and I said, Em, let me ask you a question. When you're cutting hair, do you just look at your job as cutting someone's hair? Or do you think about what you've done for someone after? Do you think about the creation that you've made and how you made someone look better? I said, because for me, I love the feeling when I walk out of here 
got that fresh, clean haircut. I love that. I love that feeling. It feels good. Can, can I get an amen? You guys understand that? It's like, that feels good. I feel good. I'm looking good. And so the point is, is that there's a, your assignment is to become a legacy or will become a legacy to other people. Think about your mother. Think about your father. Is there one word that describes them? Maybe it was a teacher in school. Is there one word that this person who was a teacher, who didn't think that their job was like the best job in the world or struggled in the middle of it, but did that teacher make a difference in your life? And that's what you have to remember when, you're, when we go to work day in, day out, and do the same things over and over. Sometimes we forget that God has a plan and God wants to work through us to make a difference um, in the world. And so, um, so that's what happened to Phoebe. Her assignment changed the world. Now, let me give you three things we can learn from her ministry, okay? The first one is this. It's recommendation. And you can fill that in. Here's what Paul says. I commend to you. He says, it means I approve, I recognize, I, re I recommend this lady to you. I recommend her ministry to you. I ask you to welcome her. Um, he says, I want you, she's got a great ministry. She has a great ministry in her home. She has a great Bible study. Um, and why does he recommend it? He said, because she's a servant of the church. This lady not only delivered the letter but she served in a great capacity. And so, and then I hear people like discuss things like this. Well, what are women's role in church? Should women be in ministry? I'm like, are you kidding me? We wouldn't have ministry if we didn't have women. Can I get an amen from the ladies, right? This is what ladies do. I think about these women's Bible study and Lynette and Casey and Melissa and Mindy and Katie. They're all doing this work behind the scenes. This is super important stuff. And this is the glue that holds ministry together. The second thing is this, it's assistance. And Paul writes this, he says, and help her in whatever she may need from you. And so she ha this lady has a ministry, and she's reaching out, and she's making a difference in the church. And Paul says, listen, not only do I commend her, but I say help her. Give her some help in what she's going through. Um, and to give her help she just simply means um, to assist her. And Paul's saying, um, you know, I want you guys to use your gifts. Every single person, when they become a Christian, have particular gifts. And he's saying, I want you to use your gift, and I, I recommend it. I, I want you to help her in the middle of it. And one of my rules in, in this ministry is to encourage people to use their gifts, to step out in faith, to make a difference in the world, to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you think, you know, what I said earlier, every Christian is a, is a minister, and if you don't understand that, Come to VBS and you'll see. You'll see how God can use you to make a difference in a child's life because there are kids in our day and age who never get to hear the gospel. And this opportunity to reach them can actually change their lives in the middle of it. And let me give you the last one. The last one is this. It's appreciation. He's saying, I want you to appreciate her. And he writes, for she has been a patron of many and myself as well. And the word patron is a financial uh, gift. And she evidently held up Paul's ministry, maybe took him food, whatever um, the case was. Well, she couldn't have took him food because she was writing a letter, but just held up that ministry in the middle of it all. And she said, you know, Paul said, listen, I've been ministered to by this lady. She's made a difference um, in my life. She's been such a great help. A few weeks ago, we had a family wedding and one of the uh, when a guy I know from the family was doing the wedding and I saw him before um, doing the wedding and I said hey man how you doing and he goes you know he goes I get attacked every time I go up to speak speak publicly and I'm like what do you mean he goes he's eating roll aids he goes my stomach hurts and I'm like dude I go that's called stress and anxiety. He goes, no, it's an attack. I go, call it what you want, but it's still stress and anxiety. And so after it was over, I made sure to make my, make my way to him and said, listen, you did a really good job because I know how difficult that is. You walk into this place, no one knows you, and you have to minister in the middle of it. And that's a challenge. And so that's what Paul's saying. I want you to appreciate this lady. Now, earlier I said we're ministers. Let me expand on it a little. In 1 Peter 2, 5, read this with me. You come to him as living stones, a spiritual house, and here it is, that is being built into a holy priesthood. And here's what, here's what um, Peter's writing in the middle of that. He's basically saying, hey, listen, 
you're a priest, okay? Now, depending on your background, that might be a little weird. But anyway, he's just he's saying, well, here's what he means. The spiritual benefits that priests have are now available to everyone who's a believer. In the Old Testament, priests did two things. They had the right and the privilege and the responsibility to go to, to, uh, directly to God. They could talk to God, they could worship God and fellowship with God, but everyone else had to go through them. Okay, and the second thing is this they had the privilege and the responsibility of representing God to the people and of ministering to the needs of people by serving those people. So, when you become a believer, those two, two things are still true to you. Okay, they're true uh, of you. You have direct access to God, you don't have to go through someone else, you don't have to confess to someone else. You can fellowship with God. You could read your Bible. You can talk to the Lord directly. You can fellowship with him. In Hebrews 4.16, let's read this one. We read it earlier. Let's read it again. Let us therefore go boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And basically what he's saying is, listen, when you're struggling, you go to the throne, you go to God, and you're going to get your help. In the biblical uh, temple model, there was a veil that represented, uh, that separated the Holy of Holies, where the Holy Spirit, where God's Spirit dwelt, from where the people were allowed to go. And only the priests could go behind that veil. And this only happened one time per year, okay? When Jesus died on the cross, you could read this in the Gospels, God ripped that veil, it was about 70 feet long, from top to bottom, and it was sewed from left to right, okay? But it was ripped from top to bottom, symbolizing that there is no longer a barrier between God and the people. And that's what that represents. So as a believer, in addition to having direct access to God, you have also been gifted for ministry to serve other people. Like I said, every Christian isn't a pastor, but every Christian is a minister. So the question is, can you minister in your office? Absolutely. If you're a truck driver, can you minister? Absolutely. If you're a personal trainer, can you minister? I was having a conversation with someone in the gym. I had a little break and we just sat and talked and then they sent me a Venmo payment and in the subject line they put therapy. And I'm like, perfect. That's what we want right there. So the next time you're struggling to know who you are, remember that God has equipped you to make a difference in the world. And we do that by sharing the gospel. You have direct access to God, the privilege to ministering to people. And Peter says that you're a priest. And you guys might even get a little collar and walk around with it on it just to make a difference. I, I know for me, when I do uh, funerals, I've always put a suit on. And every single time, the people that come to our church will always come up and make some smart aleck comment about how I dress up. And so I've always thought about just putting a full suit on, not telling anybody, coming out here and preaching a whole sermon and not even acknowledging that I have a suit on. So anyway, the second thing is this. I want you to note Paul's attention. Note Paul's attention. Paul's a people person. He had a warmth that attracts people to himself. Even though he'd never been to Rome, he knew all the people, and he knew them by name. He knew the believers there. And we have a long list of people in this section that he wants to greet. Actually, there are 35 different names mentioned um, in this chapter, and there are references to other people. I'm just going to go through a few that kind of jumped out at me. In the third and fourth verse, here's what he says. He says, greet Prissa and Aquila. My fellow workers in Christ, who risk their necks for my life, to whom, I, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. So Paul starts off by mentioning this husband and wife team. The, this, these two people are mentioned six times in the New Testament. And here's what Paul says. Paul says, this group, these two have helped me. They're co-workers for me. Um, and he mentions both of them, not just one. He mentions both. And, and an interesting note is that uh, uh, Prissa and Aquila's occupation was the same as Paul. They were tent makers, okay? So they were intense people. I knew Watson would like that one. Yeah, that joke was intentional. <laughs> Not everybody liked that one, but I thought it was funny. All right, so, but he says they risked their life for me. They, lived their, they, they risked their lives for me, and he was always getting in trouble. Paul was always getting in some kind of trouble, but they bailed him out. And then here's what it also says. 
greet also the church in their house. And so they had a church in their home. And we have home Bible studies. That's just the same thing as having a church. I know for me, this is where I cut my teeth on ministry. We would have up to 30 people come into our home, um, and we just open our, our own home for Bible study. And that's an in-house church. And so um, now in the fifth verse, he says, Greet my beloved Apennatus, who was my, the first convert to Christ in Asia. Now, let me ask you a question. If you've ever had a chance to uh, have a hand in bringing someone to the Lord, um, do you remember doing that? Because I know for me, when I first became a Christian, I, would just, I was just really excited about what happened, and I would, in my gym, share my faith with my friends. And I remember uh, praying with two of my buddies over the bench press and just leading them to the Lord. I still remember that to this day. And that's what Paul is saying here. He goes, I remember my first convert. And he goes, that really made a difference. It was awesome, and I still remember this particular person. Um, and he said it was the first convert in this particular area. And from that conversion, that's how things grow, and that's how life changes. Then he says this, greet ampli ampliatus, I guess that, uh, that's the name, how you pronounce that, my beloved in the Lord. So there's an interesting background story to, to this guy. This name here is a slave name. So this guy was a slave. Now, proper Romans had three names, just like we do. This, this particular guy only had one name which represented that, it, that he was a slave. Now, here's what's interesting. They discovered in the catacombs of Rome, there was this famous princess who became a Christian and was thrown to the lions, and they were putting a, a tomb for her. But they discovered in the catacombs, they discovered this guy's tomb. And what they found was this tomb was decorated above everyone else. There were hand uh, incredible inscriptions and roses, um, and they, there was tremendous honor to this particular person. And even though this guy was a slave, he was highly respected in the church. And when he died, they made an incredible tomb to him. And so in the New Testament, here's what you see. There are no class or social distinction in the middle of this. These people are Christians. And then I'm going to show you something else Paul does. Paul is very subversive in his writing. And so you have these people who are leaders in the country. And so they're running everything. And then Paul writes something to, uh, indirectly to these leaders. And so here's what he says. He says, greet, um, where are we at? There we go. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Okay. And then here's what he says. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. And so it doesn't say greet Aristobulus, but greet the people who belong to this family. Um, so this guy wasn't a Christian, okay? But he was the grandson of Herod and one of the best friends of Claudius, who if you've been with us, Claudius kicked all the Jewish believers out of Rome. And so then they came back in. And so this guy was an immensely wealthy man. He wasn't a believer. Um, but evidently, what happened is he's a great leader in the, in the social area. But what happened was there were believers who had infiltrated the government. And Paul subversively wanted everyone to know that. So he's saying, hey, greet these families in the middle of it. He wanted to know that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, and, had, and he wanted them to know how powerful it was and what a difference it makes. Then he, make, then he says, uh, he also mentions a relative, Herodian. He says, greet my kinsman, Herodian. And then he says this, greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of narcissists, okay? Obviously, this guy was a bit narcissistic, but we'll leave that alone. But anyway, this guy wasn't a Christian, but evidently his family was. Some people in his household, same thing here. Narcissus was the appointment secretary for Claudius, the Roman governor. And what you did, if you wanted to get message to the Roman governor, you had to go through Claudius. And what Claudius would do is he would charge you, and the people who paid the most money, they could get a letter to the, govern, uh, to the governor, or they can get a meeting with the governor. And so they said that this guy became a multimillionaire by, you know, by, by selling these things and, and by corruption. In the middle of it, one of my... Uh, one of my young clients was in, and I was talking to him about this, and he says, do you think that there's corruption in government now? 
<laughs> right? <laughs> Do we even have to answer that? What kind of question is that? So now I'm going to give you a command here for our church. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. I don't know if he's in here or not, but Rufus does a ton of work behind the scenes, and I just couldn't um, resist saying that. So if you get a chance, just thank that guy, because he works very, very hard at what he does. And so, uh, you know, we were meeting a few weeks ago. There, I got a message from someone, and they said, hey, we lost our pastor um, in our church. Do you know anybody that you know, that you could recommend for us to be a pastor. And I said, you know, I don't, but I said, but we can meet with you guys and talk to you. We can, we, and we're going to do this next week. We can stream our services to you until you find someone. So Rufus and I, we went and met with these people. It was just really fun to do because I'm kind of a visionary person. Like they're saying, hey, here's where we are. And I'm like, oh, here's what we can do. But Rufus is super practical. And so he was able to, and we just work very well together like that. And then um, they were saying, well, why would you do this for us? And, um, you know, he just said, listen, we've been blessed, so we want to be a blessing. And that's the whole idea of what the church does for each other. We're not in competition with each other. Um, we're in it for each other. And that's really important to remember. So Paul is this warm fellow. He sends greetings to everyone. He affirms everyone. He compliments everyone. He is always building people up. And that was part of his gifting. He's an incredible encourager. Now, the third thing I want you to see, know Paul's awareness. Now he starts getting practical again. And this is the third part of this last chapter. It's his caution. And, and if you just Here's the thought. You just finished writing this great treatise, this great letter to these people. You give them all kind of doctrinal teaching. Here's what Jesus has done for you. Here's where you are. Here's the idea of how to change. And so he goes, let me, let me just kind of give you guys an overview, okay? I do this a lot, but I'm going to give you an overview of the book of Romans. And here's what, it, here's what the book of Romans is. So what Paul does is in the first few chapters, he writes to all men, all people, all men and women, everybody on the face of the earth. And he's saying everyone is born um, in Adam, okay? And when you're born in Adam, basically saying you are born in sin. So he shows everyone that they have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he says, you see it in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So everyone is not in Christ. And then what he says, because you're in Adam, because you've sinned, here's this guy named Jesus who is resurrected, and he is your deliverer. He's the one who will change you. So he says, everyone has fallen short. This guy here will bring you in, um, you know, this risen God um, will put you in right standing with God. And then what he does in the third part is he tells people how to live. And it starts in like the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. So I'm going to even take this deeper. So when you see Christians and Christians act a, act a particular way and you think this Christian should act in a better way, let me explain to you what's going on. When you accept the Lord, what happens is you're a new creation inside. It's an instantaneous thing. It's not something you work into. It is God's gift to you. You're saved by grace through faith, and this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God so that no man can boast. So you have this internal change. You are now righteous. You're holy. Um, you, God sees you perfectly because he looks at you through what Jesus has done. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying there? So when this happens, now there's a part that we play, and this is what Paul is teaching. In this particular part that we play, and it starts in like the 11th, 12th, 13th verses of, of the book of Romans, he says, this is how you should now live. And so he starts it off by saying that we are to renew our, does anybody remember the word? Mind. We renew our mind through the word of God. So when you see a Christian acting in a particular way, and you think, well, how can they even be a Christian? They can be a Christian and not act right because their mind hasn't, they're not along the journey, as far along the journey as, may, as you might be. Does that make sense? So we're growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. This is why we study the scripture. This is why we do books of the Bible, so that you can change and by changing your mind, because the way you think is going to affect the way you act and the way you act is going to affect the way you live. And that's what he's talking about here. I don't even know where I was, but anyway, it was kind of a tangent of the book of Romans. It makes sense though, right? This is how, this is the gospel as a whole. And this is like, for me, as I've studied this and I'm just like looking at this and I get to the end of this, I'm like going, holy cow, I see the gospel more clear and I understand things in a different way. And if I went through it again, I would even get more revelation on it, but we're growing in the grace and the knowledge of God. So as Paul writes this 
letter, he gets to this point, he, he gets to the end, he says, here's what I want you to do, though. I have a word of caution for you. I want you to promote unity in the church. And then he goes on to write about it. He says, don't allow dissension. He says, I, he says, I appeal to you, brothers. And when he's talking brothers, he's talking about everybody, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause division, divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Well, what's the doctrine they've been taught? It's the gospel, right? He talks off in the first verse, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. So he's saying that there are other people who cause divisions in the church. Now, why did he write this? Let me give you another, let me give you some more background. You have a Jewish set of people who are meeting in synagogues who hear about this risen Savior, Jesus. They become Christians. You have Gentile people who have heard about this risen Savior, Jesus. They become Christians. The Jewish people have the law. The Gentile people don't have the law. They don't understand the law. They blend these two together. The Jewish people are saying, the people who have the law are saying, hey, you better follow the law. And the other people are saying, hey, I don't even know what the law is. So now you have church conflict. Does that make sense? Anybody ever been in church and people don't get along? Right? It's like the political question I just asked. All right. So anyway, so here's what he's saying. He's saying, I appeal to you, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Look at those two ver last two words. Read them with me. Avoid them. He's saying have boundaries for people who are troublemakers. Don't hang out with them. It's not going uh, 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 to it, help you in any way. He says, for such persons do not serve our Lord, Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to, as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. And then let's read the last part together. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so Paul is saying, look, man, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And he's saying, I want you to be um, aware. And he's saying, be innocent about evil things um, that are going on. Okay, he's saying, I want you to understand what's going on, but be innocent. Somebody was in a, a, another country and they sent me a picture of a, uh, they were in tai, Taiwan. They sent me a picture and the picture said, stop reading the news. So, and I always tell you guys that. I, and, and here's the thing, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be informed, but I, I am saying that we shouldn't be consumed. Have you ever been around people who are consumed? And when you're around them, it, it just becomes a negative thing. So we're to be in, informed on what's going on, but we're to be consumed by the gospel and our relationship with Christ. Can I get an amen with that? That's what we're to be consumed. And when we're consumed with that, that will begin to out, come out of us and people, it'll make a difference uh, in the world. And so Paul's just saying this, listen, I want you to just maintain unity in the middle of this, about a week ago, I'm driving home from the gym, and I look over and I see, I see some ducks walking on the street. I see a mother duck and her ducklings. And here was the great part of it. They were walking within the lines, the jaywalking lines, um, and they were actually waiting for cars. To, it was just like the coolest thing. I was trying to get a picture um, and I couldn't, but they were just totally unified in their walking. It was just really cool. So I went home and I, I thought, um, I'm going to just read about ducks because that's interesting that they would do that. So here's what I read. I read that duck have accents. City ducks are typically louder than country ducks. Did you guys know that? So if any of you ever go to Jeopardy and you get this and you win a bunch of money, you got a tithe, right? So I, I read that ducks can sleep with one eye open to watch out for predators. I read that a sh the shape of a duck's bill has a purpose. Flat bills are to consume plant materials while pointed bills are to catch and eat fish. And, and of course, here's the big one. We're Team USA and we're gathered together um, from across the nation. And you know why? Read this with me. Ducks fly to you guys knew, right? Okay, let me just go on with that. So, all right. And just when you think they're about to break apart. All right, let's do it loud together. And when the wind blows and the sky is black. And one more, and when the roosters are crowing, the cows are spinning circles in the pasture, ducks fly together, right? And so what he's talking about is just unity, and that's the whole idea, is just unifying. So that was my little unity illustration. All right, let me give you the last one. Note Paul's admiration. And this is a benediction and a praise to God. 
that's what he's doing here. And so Paul closes his letter off like this. He says, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel. Where does our strength come? It comes from the gospel. Um, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed to the prophetic writings and has been made known to all nations. He's talking about the gospel here. According to the command of the eternal God, let's read the last, last part together, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only one, to only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this is the purpose of the church. God leaves us here on the earth after we become believers so that we can share our faith with other people and we can make a difference in the world so that all nations might believe and all nations might obey because God wants each and every one of us um, in his family. And so, so in this church, here's what you had. You had a group of people who were a mess. There's a bunch of people who are messed up, who are struggling in the middle of what they're going through. We think that New Testament believers were like this perfect bunch. If you read the book of Corinthians, there was a guy sleeping with his stepmother. And so it's super weird. And they got all kinds of things going on, but they're strugglers in the middle of everything that's happening. And I read this quote. It's from a guy named Brennan Manning. It's from, I think it's from a book called The Ragamuffin, Go uh, Ragamuffin Gospel. Um, and there's this thing in Revelation 7, 9 where all the nations and all the people who are broken but live their faith out are standing before the Lord. So here's what he writes. He says, because salvation is by grace through faith, I believe that among the countless number of people standing at the throne in front of the Lamb, dressed in white and holding pa uh, palms in their ha hand, he says, I believe I shall see the prostitute from the Kit Kat Ranch in Carson City, Nevada, who tearfully told me that she could find no other employment to support her two-year-old son. He says, I believe I shall see the woman who had an abortion and is haunted by the guilt and remorse, but did the best she could, faced with grueling alternatives. She says, I he says, I believe I will see the businessman besieged with debt who sold his integrity in a series of desperate transactions. I believe I will see the uh, insecure clergyman addicted to being like who never challenges people from the pulpit and long for un unconditional love. He says, I believe I will see the sexually abused teen molested by his father and now selling his own body um, on the streets. And as he falls asleep each night, um, he whispers the name of the unknown God that he learned about in vacation Bible school. But how, we ask. Then the voice said, they have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There they are. And there we are. The multitude who wanted so bad to be faithful, who at times got defeated, who at times got soiled by life, who at times got bested by trials, wearing the bloodied garments of life's tribulations, but through all of it, they clung to faith. My friends, if this is not good news to you, you have never understood the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, as we come to the close of this letter, we look at these saints, saints from 2,000 years ago, um, and their lives, mentioned by Paul, <clears throat> still have a message to us. So God, help us to remember this. Help us to honor you in the gospel. To remember that what you've done for us is what it's all about, not what we do. So we honor you in the middle of that, Lord. And, and help, us to, help us to remember what Paul is doing here. He's, he's, a, he's complimenting people. He's creating unity. He's encouraging people. God, let us have that in our lives. Let us encourage one another. But let us mostly remember the gospel and to honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone said. And then have you guys stand. We'll close together in worship. Your splendor in man.
If you guys need prayer, prayer to my right, your left. Those of you watching online, there's a number you can call. Um, next week, we're going to look at um, we're going to look at the story. It's Father's Day, so we're going to look at a story, and I'm calling it the Prodigal Father. But it's the story of the prodigal, um, and so we're going to look at that from a, a different perspective. Um, make sure you sign up for Helping in VBS if you haven't already. Uh, I think that covers everything. Now for a benediction, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you guys. Have a great day.